The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. But if this population is gone, then the natural population, the wild population, is gone. And we don't have it anymore in Texas. I like some competition in the fishing just because it pushes me to try to get better at it. You can throw so much water back up all the way to the bridge where, where we would be here on the signal bridge. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. In far west Texas, amongst the rocky and rough terrain, lies the Trans-Pecos. In this dry Chihuahuan desert region, aquatic life lives on in rivers, creeks, and cienegas. Many of these fish are only found here in the desert, adapted to survive in these harsh conditions. Because of lack of water and loss of habitat, we have a lot of fish in West Texas that are threatened. One fish in particular, the Pecos pupfish, is in serious trouble. With habitat fragmentation, loss of water, and now a new threat, hybridization. This desert dweller's existence is on the brink. Wow, this has really changed. Well, wow. I think our site is right down there. Ken Saunders has been working out here in West Texas for 27 years. And today he's out to check on the Pecos pupfish. So it looks like we have a big platform rig that's already pumping. We got this new one going in right here, and our creek's running right in between it. Four or five years ago when we started working here, we'd come out here and all you could see was the creek. You can sit here and count rig after rig after rig after rig after rig. It's just really changed the landscape a lot. So we have about three miles of creek left in the whole state of Texas that has the Pecos pupfish in it. We are hoping they're still there, and so we're gonna be taking DNA samples and shortly we'll be able to know whether we still have that fish here or not. The Pecos pupfish is just one of 24 similar small fish that are now threatened or endangered here in West Texas. So why should we care about these little fish? They're kind of the first to go. If they go, what's next? It's part of the natural system. And every time we lose part of our natural system, we lose part of us. It's, it's our world. It's, it, if we don't take care of it, what are we going to have left? The historic home for the Pecos pupfish in Texas was the Pecos River, beginning along the New Mexico border, flowing southeast all the way to the Rio Grande. Now all the pupfish has left is a small tributary up near Pecos, Texas. Look at all those babies right there. Those are a bunch of juveniles right there. That's good. But everything's not good here in this creek. These larger fish you can see here are Gulf killifish that were introduced. They're normally in the estuaries along the Gulf Coast. Oh, got a big one. Yep. Gulf killifish. Gulf killifish. Look at that big old fat belly too. Gee, I wonder what he's been eating. The Gulf killifish is the top predator to all these Pecos pupfish. You can see they get pretty big compared to our pupfish. That's a baby pupfish right there. Obviously this fish can eat that fish. 
and we're finding that they do. Okay. To help the pupfish, biologists do a quarterly fish count of sorts. We, uh, we go in and we try to do some seine hauls. Twist in the net right there. There we go. Well, once we actually uh, drag the seine through the water, we bring it up to the shore. And lift. Oh, man. Ooh Look at all those fish. And we pick out all the fish from the net, identifying which species we have, how many of each species. 10 juveniles. 15 juvies, five adults. 10 adults, two juvies. We're trying to see how many adults we have, how many juveniles we have, so we can try and establish trends. That right there is a big adult pupfish. Female, looks like she's full of eggs. The science we're doing is really important because it gives us an idea of how the population of fish are doing. Are they declining? We wouldn't know that if we didn't come out here quarterly throughout the year to monitor the population. The biggest threat to the pupfish is another introduced minnow that's kind of like an evil twin. We have an introduced fish from the Gulf Coast called the sheep's head minnow. Very, very similar to the pupfish and they interbreed. When they do, they create hybrids that are not pure pupfish. In Texas, this is the last natural stronghold where the Pecos pupfish is still pure. It has hybridized itself, and now you can't find them anymore. They keep coming out. Yep. That's just one more problem these little guys are facing in this creek. While biologists look for solutions to the non-native species here, they're also working with landowners in the Pecos region to find creeks that can serve as a new home. Until then, they're partnering with Texas zoos so the pupfish doesn't go extinct. See? Look, you see that water? Oh, I see them now. I see what we're looking for. Here at the Fort Worth Zoo, there is a captive breeding program underway. This is basically a refuge if something happens to the natural population out in Pecos. This man-made nursery ensures that the Pecos pupfish will live on. We have a couple different age groups. Um, we've got some young fry all the way up to adults and juveniles in between. In the collection, it's probably about 250 right now. Through that effort, we've been able to ensure that this fish does not go extinct if something happens to its remaining habitat. We don't want to see these fish go endangered. It would be a big loss if it were to disappear. I hate to say it, but a lot of times our job is documenting extinction. Mike, we're gonna start with number 60. To see if extinction is upon us here and now, and the fish have indeed hybridized, some molecular biology is about to begin. So we're gonna be taking DNA samples and shortly we'll be able to know whether we still have that fish here or not. But if this population is gone, then the natural population, the wild population, is gone. And we don't have it anymore in Texas. As for this creek and the pupfish, it's no doubt a struggle. But these biologists provide hope. With all the, the work that we're doing, the monitoring, we hope that it's having a, a benefit to the species. You know, we're gonna continue fighting the good fight. When we came in January, we caught less than 10 or 12 total in all of our sampling. Oy. Yeah. <laughs> so for us to be able to drag two seine hauls and literally catch hundreds of juveniles, and that's a good thing. We just hope they're pure. If they're pure, then we still have a very healthy population. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to go into it and find so many numbers and see that it's still there, that it's persisting, and there is, in fact, pupfish, and there's a lot of reproduction going on, which is a good sign. The reason I'm out here and the reason I do this, even though it's at times very disheartening to see what's happening, is because if we don't fight the battles, we won't win any at all. Through our efforts, we may be able to keep so. some fish alive. Yeah. It's 
not for me to decide to throw my hands up. My job is to continue working as hard as I can to protect these fishes and these natural habitats uh, for future generations. And that's why we do what we do. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Sport Fish Restoration Program. My family and then my teaching and, and then bass fishing was sort of the order of things. That he basically teaches fishing and how to fish just like he taught, you know, species and, and, and all the other things when he was actually teaching in the university. Anybody that meets him or is around him very long picks up knowledge from him. A little hybridization, nothing like pure smallmouth. Educators can really be judged by the network they create. He has had students go into academia. He's had them work for different conservation agencies, water quality agencies, parks and wildlife, EPA. There was a huge network of folks out there that had some influence from Dr. Whiteside. And so we all kind of held a, a very common bond. I'm always kind of amazed about how many people worked with Whiteside and came through his, his program here. He would sit down with you and work through things with you. If you didn't understand, he was going to help you to understand. You know, it's like your kids. You'd like for your kids to be brighter and smarter than you and do better and just trying to get the most I could out of whichever student it was. You rock things. But you'd be a full throw out. You'd be sitting in three foot sometime on schedule. I got great friends and still have several members in there that's 20 to 35 years they've been in the club or longer. He never met a stranger. He was always in the boat talking, teaching, and even with our competition. And it always would aggravate the club members that, you know, Whiteside's out there helping so-and-so catch some fish. <laughs> I like some competition in the fishing just because it pushes me to try to get better at it. When I was in the club, we did start the, the brush project at Canyon Lake that's still going on today. We did quite a few kid fish events. Once that bass club, uh, you know, they had a lot of participants, they, it was growing. He called me up one day and said that uh, they wanted to start donating to aquatic biology majors, that he established a scholarship. We still have several students supported. He was then instrumental on in getting this Freeman Aquatic Biology Building built. Well, when we first started it, it was abandoned. It had an old garage building that was a wooden building and dirt floors, and we started it aquatic biology program, which is now probably the largest aquatic program in the state of Texas. Him and Tim Bonner wrote the book on uh, freshwater fish for the state of Texas. Having an image was important for us. A lot of the fishes in Texas are only found in the state. No other state fish book will have these fishes in them. A huge milestone for himself, for Texas, and you know, for our profession. If I hadn't run into him, I wouldn't have had a almost 30 year career. He quickly, you know, not only became a mentor, but he was actually, you know, like a father away from home for me. Most of the students that he, that he meets of mine now, he invites them out to go fishing. He's always wanting to get more people out there fishing. When I landed on that beach that day, the noise was tremendous. The shells are going off everywhere. Men are dying, getting killed, getting hit, wounded. And frankly, I was terrified. The year was 1944. The event, Operation Overlord. D-Day had arrived. A full-scale invasion coast of France by Allied forces trying to bring freedom to Europe. 
the USS Texas was there. The whole bow of the ship would be down under the water as it bounced up and down. It would throw so much water back up all the way to the bridge where, where we would be here on the signal bridge. And it would throw enough water up on the signal bridge that it slammed it against the deck. Whenever the guns went off in that turret, why, well, it um, nearly shook you off of the <laughs> ship. And uh, my phones flew off my head and scared me half to death. And he had to grab me and hold me, I think, the first time. My ears rang for about three weeks after it was all over. And of course, at the end of the day, our faces were black from the gunpowder. And uh, it was really quite a show. A survivor of two world wars, the battleship Texas now rests proudly next to the San Jacinto Monument near Houston. But on this day, the 50th anniversary of D-Day, veterans have come to the Texas to remember their fallen comrades and a ship that changed their lives. Interesting time, a scary time, frequently. When I think of it now, I think of just how fortunate we were, those of us who did survive, because there was shells landing all around us. For many veterans, images of D-Day are still very clear. I scooped out a shallow spot that I could get closer to, to the earth with. And John Hooper was in the Army and part of the infantry assault at Omaha Beach. German artillery was landing in that area, and about five seconds later, one came a little closer, and another five seconds, another one came closer. And I said to myself, Hooper, if you don't get out of here, you're going to get the next one. So I got up and crawled and sort of ran or whatever I could do forward about 20 or 30 yards. Flopped down again when I heard another shell coming in and it exploded behind me as I turned around to look to see where it hit. And it hit that ramp that I just got off of. Men were still climbing off of that ramp. Pieces of the ramp flew into the air. It must have killed several of them. When we did get to the beach over there, we had to feel our way along to be sure we didn't hit a landmine. There were so many of them. You just sweat it out real good. They asked us if we had, uh, were Navy or Marines or what, you know, and said, no, we're Navy. He said, well, get all the ammo you can. We need all the help we can out here. So uh, you never did see that person anymore. It's very emotional. I mean, you know, just after, after it, you leave these things, then it gets real tough. Run! Alongside the guns, explosions, and chaos, the men on the battleship Texas were comforted by a voice, that of Chaplain LeGrand Moody. Captain of the ship called me in prior to the invasion. He said, Chaplain, more than 60% of our crew is below decks when we're at battle stations. And he says, I want you to come up to the bridge and take the loudspeaker system that goes all through the ship, take that microphone, and give a blow-by-blow -blow description of any action that we get into. First, the airplanes came over and dropped bombs on the beach, and then there were ships shooting. It looked like a gigantic Fourth of July. I, I, I'm reminded of some words by Louis L'Amour, the great Western writer. He said, there's nothing like gun smoke and sweat to draw men together. And you find that on a ship. I mean, we were, the jobs that we had, those men were sweating and the gun smoke was everywhere. The crew on this ship were like members of extended family, like some of your cousins or your brothers. 
And if you've watched this group around here, you'll see them shake hands and, oh, I'm so glad to see you. Oh, I haven't seen you since so-and-so. There's just something special about the Texas. So was the Texas your first ship after the transport on the Wyoming? That's right. Architect Steve Files has spent many hours on restoration efforts aboard the Texas. On this D-Day anniversary, he's tapping into the minds of veterans, and we're searching parts of the ship rarely seen by visitors. These guys are still the guys who were in the spaces. They know what they did. They know what their buddies did. It's just like being in, <laughs> like being in jail. You couldn't get out of here until that was over with. <laughs> I think as far as going to a specific space, it, it's really good to get these guys down there because that can trigger memories that they don't even realize they've got. We're getting close to it now. Steering aft, where all the quartermasters lived, if you want to call it that. Uh, this is true deja vu. I was coming off watch, and uh, at midnight I went past the galley, and I had seen this wooden box with the uh, armor's uh, ham on it. And when I got it down here, which was quite a feat, bringing it down three decks, we lowered it down. I think I asked somebody to help me. In any event, when we got it down here, we found out it was bacon. You see where the light is here? Yeah. That was all open, and you could literally go in there, and I hid it back there until the heat uh, subsided maybe a month or so. Okay, I never thought I'd ever see this again. Getting that real close to the very stern. The skin of the ship was where, and this is where the rudder pierces the skin of the ship. That little story I was telling you, this is where I hid the bacon. I never thought I'd ever be back here. This is truly quite a sensation. For some veterans who served aboard the Texas, coming home was as overwhelming as the battle itself. My family in Kentucky had heard on the radio that the Texas had been sunk. And I went home with my family thinking that I probably was dead. And I walked in and I suppose you can imagine what their surprise was. They were in shock. I didn't realize myself that the Texas had been reported so at the time. And of course they were crying and laughing. I guess we all got pretty emo emotional at that time. Crawling across that beach with, with the dead and wounded lying all over, wondering if I'm gonna make it. Fortunately, we did. And we were really thankful for the Navy for being able to silence those shore defenses. That was wonderful. I would like to meet the Navy chaps just to let them know that, well, hey, here, I survived. <laughs> My name is Henley. I was Henley. on the USS Texas during the invasion in Normandy. I was the director corner for the secondary battery on the port side. And I actually closed the key when the guns fired and I had a good telescope up there and I could see everything and see what was going on on the beach. Amazing. That's interesting. I'm certainly grateful for your support because my name is John Hooper and I landed with the 29th on a sector called, we were supposed to land on a sector called Easy Green. We landed on Easy Red on Omaha Beach. We were certainly grateful for your fire support. Hello, I remember this day. I shall too. <laughs> 50 years, the blink of an eye, memories that last a lifetime.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels. Over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.